to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and with psalms. When you appear on the last day and the sign of your cross will shine brighter than the sun, gather us before you and surround us with your eternal light that we may raise glory and thanks to you to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross a strong fortress for his flock, and he established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. O oh Christ, our God, by your precious cross, you have given us perfect salvation and have made us worthy to celebrate this feast with hymns of praise proclaiming. Blessed are you, O wood of the Holy Cross, for you erased Adam's curse and restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you united heavenly and earthly beings. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you fulfilled the words of the prophets, enlightened the apostles in their preaching. You crowned the martyrs for their faith and honored the confessors for their loyalty. Now, O Christ, our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make the celebration of the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross a sign of security and peace. By your cross exalt your holy church and guide her shepherds, adorn her priests with virtue. Purify her deacons, help the elderly, educate children, direct the young, protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light to our brothers and sisters who have died hoping in you. May we find refuge in the shadow of your cross on the great day of your second coming that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever.
Christ our Lord, accept these prayers and the fragrance of the incense that we have offered on the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us that we may walk with you toward death and then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Saint Paul to the Thessalonians. Barachmor alaho dilan. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and your children forever. Concerning the times and the season, you have no need for anything to be written to you, my brethren. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. When men are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden disaster shall come upon them. Like labor pain upon a woman expecting, and they will not escape. But you, my brethren, are not in darkness for that day to overtake you like a thief. For all of you are children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as the others do, but let us stay alert and sober. Those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But as we are of the day, let us be watchful, putting on the breastplate of faith, charity, and the helmet that is the hope of salvation. 
For God has not destined us unto wrath, but to gain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. In order that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, as indeed you do. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Matthew, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Lord Jesus says, who then is the faithful and prudent servant whom his master has placed in charge of his household to distribute to them their food in the proper season? Blessed is that servant whom his master upon his arrival finds doing so. Amen, I say to you. He shall place him over all his property but if the wicked servant says to himself, my master is long delayed, and then begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards, that servant's master shall come then on an unexpected day and at an unknown hour, and he will punish him severely and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. This is the truth. Peace be with you. We are neither of the darkness or of the night. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So St. Paul is catechized, of course, as he goes around and announces. The apostles have a very special mission, unique in fact. They go around, they proclaim the gospel, they gather a group around our Lord, they institute the presbyters, the priests behind them, and then they move on to another place to proclaim the gospel. So this preaching, this apostolic preaching is an establishment. It's not shepherding. 
The shepherds are the priesthood that is instituted to follow after the apostles to keep the flock together and moving them in this direction. So what St. Paul means by that is he's talking about the catechesis that he's already given them, the announcement of the arrival of the kingdom. That's why the first line in this epistle says, you already are aware of the times and the seasons. You know the things involving our Lord's appearance. Because the letters to the Thessalonians deal with the end of the world. Not because the Thessalonians have any kind of specially worried occupation with the end times, as apparently from the 19th century we've had in the West, but to understand, it's understandable the, the confusion about the doctrine because of what they have been taught throughout the old law. You know, every generation in the church has certain specific things. When you look in the history of the church, different periods of time, different generations, different centuries wrestle with certain aspects of the faith. We clearly are wrestling with all the things dealing with sexual morality, which no one has for 19 centuries, but now that's the big thing for modern Christians, to deal with what is the teaching of the apostolic faith concerning the bringing forth of life of another generation into this world. What is the relation between man and woman? That is an aspect which is to our case. Now for the Thessalonians in that first and second generation, they're concerned about the appearance of the day of the Lord. And it's not a surprise that they think it's happening now because they believe our Lord is the Messiah. When you look in the old law, and it is actually through quite of the prophets, you see it around continually, Amos, Joel, the other prophets, this term, the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh, the day of God, this aspect of the appearance of God's straightening everything out that is coming, that is in the old law. But it also seems in many times to be dovetailed or coinciding with, this, with the arrival of the Messiah. So for the Thessalonians in realizing that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, God incarnate, then this must be the moment in which God is going to introduce himself into history in a much more definitive way. God has always introduced himself into due time, into history. This is the foundation of the people of Israel. But the idea that God would intervene for the straightening out of everyone, Israel and all the non-Israelites, it seems to come at the same moment with the Messiah. And so, and then of course John the Baptist comes and our Lord comes. It's the beginning of his preaching. He says, now is the appearance of the kingdom. Now the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, that makes it even more clear. This intervention is going to take place. So the Thessalonians are not obsessed with the end of the world in some kind of evangelical or 19th century Adventist. You know, when you see the terms of Seventh-day Adventist, which is birthed from a woman that's actually from Maine, that whole religion. Um, it's important to understand the 19th century, we're all in expectation of the world's going to collapse, as they were also in the 10th century. If you read the history of the church in the 900s, there is a true working up around the year 1000 coming. Because of course in the book of the apocalypse, it says our Lord will reign for a thousand years. And so by the time you hit the 980s, it's about the same way you got, we got hysterical in a technological way about Y2K. So people in different generations deal with aspects of what is life, what is the gospel, what is the Christian message. And that's what the Thessalonians are doing. So St. Paul says, but you know about these things. I've told you that it's not happening now. And he reiterates it in these two letters. Because apparently some of the people, like people, you, I don't know if you've known them or not, the people in 1999 who were like racking up those MasterCard charges and racking up their credit cards, thinking, well, if it's all gonna crash anyways, I might as well whoop it up. And so you had that record-breaking amount of bankruptcies filed in the year 2000 because we didn't disappear. It's that type of a thing. So St. Paul in the letter to the Thessalonians in another place will say, look, you have to keep working. Because apparently there are people like, well, if there's no harvest coming this spring, why plant? And then just spend your time going around house to house and gossiping in the streets. 
Human nature doesn't change, it's exactly the same thing. But what we have in the epistle today is St. Paul takes the advantage of this idea of waiting for the day of the Lord and says to them, reminds them, you know, I've taught you these things already. What are the days and the seasons? What is coming? I've taught you this already. But he spins it now and makes it clear to understand on the moral question. So what are we supposed to be doing? Our Lord is not appearing, well, he might appear in the next 10 minutes, but as far as the expectation of what is coming, it's always in our future. And so he says, so our, our way of living has to be that of the light. And so he starts comparing light and darkness, because of course the day of the Lord is to come, the eternal and luminous one to come and to cause darkness definitively to scatter. So he says, as we are children of the light, and always that benai, that always that notion of being child or sons of the light, doesn't, it isn't a poetic term. It means that we are influenced and engendered and in our extension of light. It's not just in a historical sense that we're baptized, that we're illuminated. So the fathers always use this term illumination. St. Paul uses it in the letter to the Hebrews. We are illuminated. So it's not just that the light of God has shown in our lives, but being the children of the light means that light is what defines how we live, not just our origin by having received the faith. So it means, for example, the honesty, the directness, the lack of duplicity, the lack of darkness and innuendo and that kind of hiddenness that comes with darkness. And he says those who embrace the darkness, they embrace it because of their sensuality. That's why it says those who get drunk, they drink at night. And when you find someone drunk in the middle of the day, you know there's definitely something going on bad. It's bad enough to be drunk at night, but when someone's drunk also in the middle of the day or in the morning, then we know there's really an issue going on in this individual's life. And so he said those who sleep just go unconscious to do their sleeping. He says that happens also at night. But you are awake because you are the children of the light and you have been called in the expectation of the kingdom of God. And so you notice that what he does then is he spends, don't be concerned about a specific hour and a day that this is going to happen, but let it have the impression upon you that your yes be yes and your no be no, that your actions be direct, that your thoughts be clear, that your relationships with others have the simplicity of those who walk in the light. If we did that, that would already be a monumental transformation of morality, since by the very fact of original sin, we've talked about that woundedness that turns us inward upon ourselves and why our default mechanism is really to manipulate and control and try to make th people do what we want them to do. It's just human nature, wounded by sin. But our Lord comes to heal that wound and to turn us. And so St. Paul says, we are not of the night or of the darkness. We are children of the light. And so everything needs to be disentangled and straightened out to live in that light. It's the same terminology our Lord uses. St. John, when he makes a comment in the beginning of his gospel, when he says that those, who are of, those whose actions are good, they come to the light because they're not afraid. But those whose works are of darkness, don't look at my history on my computer. Don't look at what I have hidden in my bookshelves. That type of a thing that's in a life. He says those people go deeper into the darkness. They refuse to come to our Lord and they prefer the darkness. St. John makes the commentary by saying, but men preferred the darkness because their works were evil. So St. John, so St. Paul in this epistle is using the same thing. Live a life that can be, that is, that is inspired by the light, that walks in the light, that has a clarity in the light, and that's a life. It's not something we do periodically, but an entire life. That in itself is very difficult. Everyone has secrets. Everyone has skeletons in the closet. Everyone has a past, as they say. And that's all right. But St. Paul is saying, but now, now, we are children of the light. And from this moment on, there should be no skeletons in our closet, meaning we're not creating dead people in the, in the history of our lives as they are now. 
Whatever may be the conversion that we are coming from, that's one thing, but we are children of the light now. And we move towards that day because we desire that day. So the epistle is actually quite beautiful. It's intense because it requires a lot. Because what it's saying is, my life should be led in such a way that at any moment that our Lord returns or flicks on that light of that definitive day of God, the day of the Lord, I'm good to go. I'm not running around. He will even use the word, the terms of being naked. I'm not being exposed all of a sudden because it's happening now. We live as children of the light, meaning that we live in every moment that we're ready. Because that's the ultimate message in this letter to the Thessalonians, is that the day of the Lord is coming, and therefore the Christian life is a continual vigil. We're waiting. Not in a neurotic waiting to build a bunker in the backyard type of waiting, but of a waiting of an expectation of luminosity and clarity. To live a life in which we said the yes means yes and no means no. And if you abuse me because I'm honest and straightforward, shame on you. But I'm not going to become duplicitous because I think you may be duplicitous. That is a horrible way of living. That is the way the world lives and it's the way the children of darkness live. It doesn't mean that we spew out anything that's in our mind. That becomes offensive. But it does mean that we live in a way in which what we communicate has that clarity and that lucidity and our virtues are those things that we pursue which are the strength and the light. And so Christian life then in that view is an entire vigil. We're waiting, we expect. And should it happen in 10 minutes? Wonderful. If I should be dragged out to the age of 130, it's gonna be hard, but wonderful. Because this is the will of the Lord. And so it's a very simple, straightforward lesson, but it's a bit like the teachings of St. Teresa of Lisieux that she calls her little way. Well, anyone who knows her teaching knows that it may be called the little way, but it doesn't mean the easy way. And so the same thing when we say that we are children of the light, it's all very poetic, but it is a very demanding. So that's why he then goes on to finish by saying, and so that whether we are asleep or awake, we belong to the Lord. Now, of course, these terms don't mean physically sleeping. They mean whether we are alive or dead. Because we are not children of the wrath. Our lives are not meant to be punished on that day of the Lord. We are not destined for wrath, he says. Of course, if we live as children of the light that we have been called to, we are not then children of that darkness. We are not children of the wrath to come. But that's why he says, but then living as children of the light, whether we, are, whether we are awake or asleep, in this instance means whether we are alive or whether we are dead, we belong to the Lord. And to be in union with him, because he died for us to bring us into union with himself. Here is one of those moments in the scriptures that I've directed you to about this idea that the call of the gospel is the transformation in union with God. It's not some happy place we fly off to when we, when we die. The pagans had that notion. That's just a pagan notion. The notion that St. Paul gains today is what our idea of heaven is. Heaven is belonging to the Lord in a transformation in union with the Lord, which begins now which begins as children of the light. So as always, I encourage you, go back, you keep the bulletin, go look up other translations of the text if you want. Compare the text, look at them, meditate on them during the season of the Holy Cross. But I just wanted to leave you with that kind of, in one way, hiddenness, very simple life to be lived as children of the light, and just to encourage you in that hiddenness that looks towards the future of why, why they have asked, the eparchy has asked, that this day be the Sunday of the order of St. Charbel. This vision towards the future, as Maronites especially, is the continuity of that priesthood from our father Saint Maron dying in the year 410 all the way to that day that our Lord will appear in glory. And in the midst of that is the continual apostolic work of the transformation of each generation of those who have ears to hear 
But in the very core of it, as it's the core and the foundation of Beit Marun, is that priest, St. Marin, and the priest who continue generation after generation. Without the priest, there is no church. And so that vision of the future, when we talk about the order of St. Charbel, it is that which allows us as Marians in a very hidden way to belong to an order who functions through their prayers, through their hiddenness, and through their financial aid to also help in the education of the seminarians in this generation. We take care of our generation and they'll do fine in the year 2130. But for us, we have only our generation as children of the light. And as you have the notes that are in there from the bishop, it costs almost a half a million dollars per year to us to educate these young men. Catholic U is not a cheap place. And the eparchy is very generous. The eparchy covers all their costs and even gives them a stipend. I said, this is like a fellowship. I was taught, when I talked to our seminary, I said, this is pretty posh. When I went to the seminary, I used to get a bill every semester. And so the, the eparchy is very generous to take care of these men which is a beautiful thing. But it also means the eparchy has to come up with between four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars and $500,000 a year to cover these expenses, to run the seminary, to pay for the tuitions and all of this. The order of St. Charbel <clears throat> predates the eparchy. It was the children of the light in the 1950s and the 1960s who gathered together and established in the 60s the Order of St. Charbel, at the same time that we founded the seminary, both of them predating the arrival of a bishop. This is not for other people to do. This is for you and I. This is for us to do, that we have young men who can be formed for the future as we await the day of the Lord. Simplicity, humility, straightforwardness and our desire is as we wait for the day of the Lord that the apostolic work of the church continue as it centers upon that apostolic ministry and that continuation through priesthood faithful and the flock as we move towards the day in which God will straighten everything out the day of the Lord may we walk as children of the light and consider whether or not a part of what you should be doing now is to help in that hiddenness, to pray for the vocations and to help support those vocations. When the, when the bishop says that in his little note that there are 300 new members in the last few years, seven of those members are here in this parish among you. Those individuals have already stepped forward and says, I will help with this formation because this formation will aid souls long after I am dead. That priesthood will still bring the gospel prepare the children of light, and bring us an expectation of that life of Christian vigil waiting for the day of the Lord. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen.
confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your blessings, of spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint James, the Brother of God. And remember, O oh God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
We continue with the Anaphora of St. James, Brother of the Lord, on page 794. 794. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. <clears throat> o God, the Father, lover of all people, though we are unworthy, make us worthy of salvation, purified of deceit and hypocrisy, and united in the bond of love and peace. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, we give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you, now and forever. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. upon those who bow before your holy altar. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O God the Father, in your love for all people, you sent your Son into the world to bring the lost sheep back to you. Do not turn your holy face away from us as we celebrate this spiritual and bloodless sacrifice, relying on your mercy and through the grace of your only Son. We ask that this mystery instituted for our salvation not be for our condemnation. Rather, may it blot out all our sins, forgive our faults, and be an expression of our thanks for your goodness. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you my brothers and sisters forever and with your spirit. let us lift up our thoughts our minds and our hearts we Thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just. Truly, it is right and just to glorify you, bless you, praise you, adore you, and give you thanks, O Maker of all things visible and invisible. The highest heavens and all its powers praise you, the sun, the moon, and all the stars, the earth, the seas, and all that is in them, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, the angels, archangels, and heavenly hosts all sing, praising your majestic glory with triumphant hymns, with never-ending voices, and with sweet acclamations. They cry out and they proclaim. Truly, you are holy, O God, the Father, King of ages, and giver of holiness. Holy is your only Son, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ. 
holy is your life-giving spirit. Down is into all things, even into the depths of God. You are holy, the almighty, the creator, and the good one. You formed us from the dust of the earth and gave us the jars of paradise. When we had transgressed your commandments and fell, you did not abandon us, but like a good and merciful father, you instructed us. Through the law you called out to us, through the prophet you gave us. And at the appointed time, we sent your only Son, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, into the world to renew your image. He came down, and by the Holy Spirit became flesh of the Holy and ever Virgin Mary, and dwelt among us, accomplishing all things for our salvation. Until I come again. into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your glory is second coming, when you shall judge the world with justice, and reward all people according to their deeds. Now we ask you, do not repay us according to our sins and transgressions, but in your compassion and love for all people, cleanse us of all our sins. We, your people and your inheritance, implore you and through you and with you, implore your Father, saying, sinful children receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them Tongues of fire. <coughs> 
Giving body, a saving body, a heavenly body, a body that redeems our souls and bodies, the body of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life for those who receive it. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice, the blood of the new covenant, a life giving blood. A saving blood, a heavenly blood, a blood that redeems our souls and bodies. The blood of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and for eternal life for those who receive it. Amen. May these holy mysteries be for the sanctification of the souls and bodies of those who share in them that they may excel in all good deeds. May they be for the strengthening of your holy church, which you have founded upon the rock of faith, so that the gates of hell shall not prevail against her, delivering her from all heresies and doubts until the end of time and forever. We offer you, O Lord, this sacrifice for your holy church throughout the world and for the holy places that you glorified by the presence of Christ your Son, especially for Zion, Jerusalem, mother of all the churches. Be mindful of our pure bishops who spread the word of truth, especially our blessed fathers, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our bishop, and all the orders of the church and those who serve her. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our parents and all our brothers and sisters, those who are here praying with us, those who are not here, and those who have asked us to remember them in our prayers. Answer the petitions that will lead to their salvation. <clears throat> Remember those who have presented offerings upon your holy altar, those for whom they have been offered, those who have desired to make an offering but were unable, those whom we have remembered and those whom we have not. Reward them with the joy of your salvation and accept their offering upon your heavenly altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders, and clothe them in your fear, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. Remember also captives and prisoners, the sick, the suffering, and the afflicted, the needy, and those who labor in all walks of life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, the holy and glorious ever-Virgin Mary, the patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, St. John the forerunner, St. Stephen the archdeacon and first martyr, St. James the brother of the Lord, St. Joseph, St. Jude, and St. Mary, and all the saints. In your grace, count us among them in the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers who spread the word of truth in your holy church and preached your Son, Jesus Christ, to all nations. Through their, prayers and, through their prayers, grant peace to your church and confirm their teachings in our souls. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O God of all spiritual and earthly beings, the faithful departed who have died in the true faith. Grant them rest and do not take their faults into account. 
Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. You have sanctified the offerings and the gifts presented to you, and you have perfected them by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O Holy Father, God of heaven, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God is now and forever. Yes, O Lord, our God, lead us not into temptation that we do not have the strength to endure. But when we are tempted, deliver us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo Elukulukunna. O Lord, we bow our heads before you, awaiting your abundant mercy. Send your blessings upon us and sanctify us, so that we may be worthy to share in your holy mysteries through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and his mercy and his love for all people. You are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever.
Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, bless be the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth. To Him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your worthy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord, our God, to you be glory forever.
again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
We thank you, O God the Father, for your great and indescribable love for all people. Since you have made us worthy to share in your heavenly banquet and in your Holy Spirit, do not forsake us for having received your holy mysteries, but keep us in the radiance of holiness and righteousness. With the saints, we may, may we obtain a share in the heavenly reward through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. And we glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you now and forever. Shlomo el Kuruchunna. O Jesus, our Lord, bless us, protect us, and guide us on the path of life. Favorably remember the departed of those who shared in this Eucharist that was offered upon this divine altar. Grant protection to the living and bless them with hope through the prayers of the Virgin Mary and all the saints now and forever. So it is always lovely to see you. I call attention to the last line that St. Paul has in his epistle where he congratulates the Thessalonians for helping one another, aiding one another, and edifying, literally building up one another in the body of Christ. And as he said to the Thessalonians, which you are doing, I also say to you, this you also do. So congratulations on this point. And on that aspect then of the priesthood, you will find information also on this edification of the church, information on the order of St. Charbel at both of the doorways, and in fact also both of the display windows beautifully set up for the occasion. Go in peace, my beloved, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishments and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God to whom be glory forever.